Okay, so our first speaker in this session will be Claire Murray, and she's going to be talking to us about deciphering multi-phase H1 with 21 sponge and artificial intelligence. Can you guys hear me? Is this all right? Mic orientation. Okay, so thanks, Mary. Uh, today I'm going to talk to us, talk to you guys about some multi-phase ISM structure. And again, it's wonderful to be at a conference where this is introduced not once but twice. So thanks, Naomi and Adam, both. So um, as a brief introduction, uh, this is the sort of general picture I'll be talking about. This is our sort of cartoon view of the star formation cycle. And it turns out that H1 makes up a large and important part of this cycle. Material cycles between the warm neutral medium and the cold neutral medium through um, an uncertain thermally unstable phase. And so an easy question to ask from this diagram is what is the temperature of H1? So um, of course, Carl Hylas and Tom Trollin did pioneering work on this. And they um, studied almost 80 absorption and emission line pairs and found that H1 in the ISM has a temperature of median, a column density weighted medium of about 70 degrees. So this is all the sort of best constraints on temperatures that they were able to find. But if we look at numerical simulations, we see that the picture is a little different. We see that the, uh, the ISM is dominated by warmer gas at thousands of degrees. So the question is, where is that material in our observation? Why has it not been recovered by the Millennium Survey? And so um, the first question to start with in, the, in answering this is, what do we see if we go to better sensitivity? The Millennium Survey um, was not as good as we can possibly do, and so if we ramp up our sensitivity, we should be able to see more of this material. This is a picture of Snez and Carl a, a couple years ago, and they um, addressed this in 2005. And so this is an example of what we see. On the left, I have the absorption and emission profile towards the famous calibrator 3C286. And then on the right is Snez and Carl's spectrum with a factor of 10 better sensitivity and absorption. And so what you see are um, these very narrow cold clouds pop up out of the noise when we improve our sensitivity. And so this is not the warm gas that we expected to see from simulations, but rather just more cold stuff. And so um, what we wanted to do following this study was you know, gather a larger sample of deeper, more statistically significant constraints on this material. And that's where my project comes in. It's called 21 Sponge. Um, which stands for this 21 centimeter spectral line observations of neutral gas with the VLA. And what it is, is a high sensitivity survey for H1 absorption in the galaxy. We have 52 continuum sources, mostly at high latitude. And after almost 600 hours at the VLA, we reach better than a part in a thousand in terms of RMS noise in H1 optical depth. And this gives us sensitivity to detect all kinds of warm and thermally unstable gas if it's sitting out there in the ISM. And so we have matching H1 emission from Arecibo. This is very important for constraining the spin temperature. And also a high detection rate. 49 out of 52 sources, we find um, significant absorption. So here are some example spectra from the survey. We see a whole suite of different spectral lines from strongly absorbing sources with nice flat baselines to essentially non-detection. So this is our, an example of a non-detection showing that um, we achieve really nice bandpass stability um, and excellent sensitivity and optical depth. So following the first half of the survey, we published some results um, that Naomi talked about a little earlier. And what we found is that we were able to extend this distribution from the Millennium Survey out to slightly higher temperatures, up to about 1,500 degrees. Um, however, we are still sort of puzzled by the fact that we were missing material up at you know, 4,000 degrees is what we expect for the warm neutral medium. And so to get at why we're missing this stuff, we wanted to make sure that we minimize our observational biases. And one way to do that is to compare our uh, data more directly with numerical simulations. And so the one we chose is this 3D hydrodynamic galactic ISM simulation from Kim et al. And they've got all kinds of nice ingredients for simulations. But the thing that made us very excited was that they produced a catalog of 10,000 synthetic H1 emission and absorption spectral line pairs. And so we can use this synthetic data to compare directly with our observations. However, 10 to the 4 spectra is a lot, especially if you're decomposing them by hand. As a graduate student, I can tell you it takes a long time. 
And so um, we needed to develop a new method for analyzing this data in an efficient and objective way. So last year, our group developed a new um, method called autonomous Gaussian decomposition, which is an efficient method for decomposing 1D spectral line data into Gaussian functions. And the great thing about AGD is that um, it takes advantage of machine learning and derivative spectroscopy to provide fit parameters without human interaction. So you know, there is no objective input into this decomposition. It's, it's completely machine learning based, which is the sort of artificial intelligence aspect of my title. So given AGD, we can actually um, compare our observations and simulations in a one-to-one -one way. As we all know, it's difficult to go directly from physical quantities to observed spectra. So by applying AGD to our observations and then applying AGD identically to these synthetic spectra, we can compare the basic parameters from the fits in a one-to-one -one way. And I'd like to note that this is a very fast algorithm. We were able to decompose all 10,000 spectra in about five minutes on my laptop. So um, for some initial results about what this, these distributions look like, from our observations, this is a plot showing the sort of amplitude versus line width of lines found in our observations. And we see a general scatter of points, lots piled up around line widths of a few kilometers per second, extending towards large optical depths. And our sort of median RMS and velocity resolution are indicated here. However, if we compare this distribution with the simulations, this is what we see. So this is the result of decomposing all 10 to the 4 H1 absorption lines. And we find a sort of linear trend in these blue contours from the simulations. Um, we agree pretty well at high optical depths, but down here at weak broad components, the simulations appear to find a population that we just don't see in our observations. And so uh, first question is, what do these components look like? Why aren't we seeing them in our observations? So as an example of what some of these things look like, here are some example synthetic lines of sight. And we see sort of isolated, happy, broad, warm, neutral, medium features. Um, and it turns out, however, that these things are just not seen in our observations at all. We have more than enough sensitivity to detect them. So did the Millennium Survey. So did most other absorption line surveys. And basically, we don't see anything like this. We either find essentially nothing, or we find cold neutral medium. So we find cold gas everywhere, very rarely warm gas on its own at this type of optical depth. So um, the question is, why? And one um, way we thought about investigating this is to see if the material is actually living at even smaller optical depths down here in this regime. And so a couple years ago, we performed a stacking analysis on our residual spectra to sort of beat down the noise even farther. Maybe we're just still not sensitive to this warm stuff. And we found a stacked residual absorption feature that lives down here on this plot, so well beyond our sensitivity sort of natively with sponge. And the temperature of this component is on the order of about 7,000 degrees. So this is a little higher than we expect from um, analytical theories of the ISM. And back then, we postulated that maybe this might be caused by additional H1 excitation mechanisms at work. So um, in the sort of low density warm neutral medium, we expect the transition to not be thermalized. So the spin temperature shouldn't be quite as high as the kinetic <coughs> temperature. But if you add more excitation, um, you can bring the spin temperature up to the kinetic temperature. But this type of hypothesis is something we can test directly with the simulations. So if we look at the results of these simulations without this WF effect included, we notice that this sort of population of components is enhanced. So the implication is that this effect is important for um, making these simulated spectra realistic and close to our observations. And so um, if we look at what the temperatures look like, this is the plot from the, from the Kim et al. paper showing the spin temperature versus kinetic temperature. As we see, if you include the WF effect, these spin temperatures approach your kinetic temperature values. And on top of this, I've plotted our stacked feature plus some other measurements of warm neutral medium type of gas. And so um, the way that you control this WF effect is by this density of the Lyman alpha radiation field parameter, which is actually highly uncertain. And so um, Kim et al. used the value of 10 to the minus 6. But um, it might be true that we need to sort of investigate the sort of topology of this radiation field a little more to explain these high warm neutral medium temperatures. 
Um, and so one sort of another question we can address with these simulation comparisons is the basic question of do Gaussians correspond to clouds? A lot of people use Gaussian functions for um, sort of modeling clouds in space. But the question is, how well do these correspond to velocity structures or density structures? And so the lucky thing is that in our simulations, or their simulations, we have information about the density as a function of distance, and also the optical depth as a function of velocity. So for each line of sight we go through and we match peaks in density to components found in the synthetic observations, and we can test sort of how well our um, models are reproducing actual simulated properties. And so what we find is that if we're just thinking about how well these clouds are recovered by Gaussian components, um, we actually reach excellent um, completeness in cloud, co cloud component correspondence, especially at high latitudes, just shown here in green, where the spectra are less complex and less contaminated by galactic populations. And um, at low latitudes, we're complete at about 69%. And we're excited about this because this and our other comparisons are some of the first statistically robust quantifications of cloud component correspondence. Um, and finally, we can compute fun things for these components, such as spin temperature and column density. And one thing we were investigating recently is the idea of a column density threshold required to form the CNN. Because we see the CNM everywhere in space, we want to know how it's formed and what and why. And so by plotting the spin temperature of individual spectral lines versus the total line of sight column density, we notice that we find sort of a range of spin temperatures at all column densities probed and at all latitudes. And so this is a work in progress for understanding sort of how the CNM is distributed in space. And with that, I will leave my summary and conclusions up where in the future, I'll just mention, we're very excited to apply this tool to large data sets um, to, and also additional simulations to understand the physics that underlies H1 spectral shapes. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Questions? Um, Jay in the, the back. Hi, could you go back to your 3C286 slide? Yep. Hopefully. Some of my figures are sort of large. That's why it takes a while. Especially these ones. Well, my question is simply that in emission, you observe atoms at a certain velocity that you do not see in absorption. And I was just wondering what your interpretation of that is. What is that stuff? Ah, so um, basically we see tiny, narrow absorption lines and sort of wide, broad emission lines. You're yes, about. but um, say at minus 20, you see a lot of emission and no absorption. So what is your interpretation of the gas which is producing the emission at minus 20? Um, so we think that it's buried in the noise down here. So we're just not sensitive to detecting it, probably. There are, there's also a beam mismatch between absorption and emission, which might account for some of that stuff. Um, with our but, BLA absorption lines where... But, but you're saying the gas must be very, very hot. Yeah. At least have a very high ex, uh, spin temperature. Right. And what kind of temperature? Um, so that's a good question. I think we're sort of hoping to constrain that more. It's up in the or high thousands based on the work we've done with this sort of stacking analysis, 7,000 degrees, which is... Then that sensitivity is, is another factor of five below this. So you have to get really down to see it. I love the uh, comparison with the simulations. On the bit where you're talking about recovering individual clouds to velocity components, um, and of course it gets difficult as you move into the galactic plane, is there any hope? I mean, is it that you've got just too many narrow components which get blended together and fit as a broad component? Or is there something we could do better to make that recoverable? That's a great question. We're hoping to sort of address that by investigating how we define clouds in space. I mean, right now we're just taking density cuts and there's like more sort of 3D spatial ways we can sort of fit them together to better match all the components that we see in the spectra. Yeah. So you have kinetic and spin temperatures. 
uh, have you calculated Mach numbers? And if, well, then one interesting thing to look at would be if higher Mach number always corresponds to the lower spin temperature gas. Right. That would yeah. be really interesting. So that's where look we're at. looking to do that next. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Claire again.